NHS staff arriving today for drive-through COVID-19 testing, some with more success than others. A very public display following a barrage of criticism that the government has been too slow in, as they like to put it, ramping up the testing. I had fever, body aches, uh, headache, sinusitis. I couldn't get tested because I didn't get a letter. I was trying to get hold of uh, employee, employee well-being to get appointments, but the hotline is just impossible to get through. Newly back from his own bout of coronavirus, the health secretary said he had a new five-point plan. The first pillar is swab testing in Public Health England labs and within the NHS in their hospitals. The second pillar is the creation of a brand new swab testing capacity delivered by commercial partners. The third pillar is blood tests. Now, blood tests are designed to tell whether people have had the virus and are now immune. The fourth pillar is surveillance. We're conducting some of the biggest surveys in the world to find out what proportion of the population already have the virus. Just as our top-end manufacturers have joined up the national effort to build ventilators, so the pharmaceutical companies will do the same for testing. Put together, this could see 100,000 tests by the end of April, he said. Mr Hancock himself has already been tested. Can you just tell us why you got the test and why the general public and many frontline staff didn't? There's a clear protocol that's been set out by the chief medical officer for um, who should get tests. And the decision was that those who were in a decision-making, senior decision-making uh, positions, um, as well as those who are in the, uh, in the critical jobs on the front line, um, need to get those tests. So, for instance, I think it's quite right that the Prime Minister uh, was tested and uh, I was tested. Um, and we, we need to roll that out now to have as many people as possible uh, get those tests. There has been confusion, mixed messaging and changes of policy in the past few weeks. This was an attempt to clear this up. The message from the chief scientific advisor has consistently been that a bad test is worse than no test. But even the current hospital tests, called PCR, done by swabbing up the nose and the back of the throat, are coming back negative when it is clear the patient has the virus. And the doctor, when I was put onto a ward the following day, warned me that it might come back negative and if it did he wouldn't necessarily, in fact he certainly wouldn't believe it. So, um, uh, and then that turned out to be the case. The test did come back negative and the way I knew that was because they came back again to um, put the long Q-tips down the back of my throat and up into my mind. Um, so they did it again and then I gathered the following day that it had not worked because they came and took me for a CT scan and looked at my lungs. So today's promise of 100,000 tests a day by the end of the month, including with self-testing kits, will not translate into that many patients. And with this still weeks away, the issue of personal protective equipment, or PPE, remains critical. Tonight, after nearly a week's delay, the guidance on PPE was updated to say that anyone working within two metres of a suspected or confirmed coronavirus patient should wear an apron, gloves, surgical mask and eye protection. Public Health England said there is enough stock. A patient recently treated in St George's Hospital in South London for COVID-19 shared this. The staff, paramedics, porters, cleaners, healthcare assistants, nurses and doctors have all been wonderful, so professional, kind and supportive. But I'm so worried about their health. All they have for protection are paper masks, thin plastic aprons and short gloves. All have bare arms and none have eye protection. They follow procedures rigorously, but still I feel the protection is inadequate. I don't have a clinical background, but by any measure, they're at high risk. They must be covered in virus at the end of a shift. They deserve better. St George's said staff follow national PHE guidance and that all equipment is checked with their infection control team. Well, let's hear from our political editor, Gary Gibbon, who is in Westminster now. Gary. As Victoria was saying there, this was an attempt by the government to press the reset button. Those press conferences are meant to be the moment of connection, communication uh, with the public, and they have been going badly 
uh, off the rails. Uh, there's a sense that the government comes in every day, tries to say something positive, but it can't quite deliver on it. A sense as well with some ministers, perhaps particularly the business secretary yesterday, who were just stonewalling and not answering questions. And number 10, a bit too happy to press the mute button so a journalist in a remote position can't actually uh, come back with a, a supplementary. This was an attempt to do things differently, to try and change the conversation. Government woke up to horrible headlines in the newspapers this morning and they don't want to see them again. So what uh, in that five pillar, not even five point, five pillar uh, plan that is being talked about there is an attempt to uh, actually promise something deliverable on testing and to move, move back, it must be said, to mass testing at the heart of the government's strategy. It is three weeks to the day since the chief medical officer uh, said in that very room that the government was pivoting away uh, from the idea of uh, trying to test just about everyone in the country. Testing is now mission critical, we are told. And it looks as though, uh, it, by the way, it's also uh, only three, uh, two weeks to the day since Boris Johnson stood in that room uh, before he caught COVID-19 uh, and said that uh, we should have 250,000 tests a day, hopefully very soon. So but there's a sign of just how much the messaging has been muddled up. They now have to stick to what they are saying. And what they are saying as well could lead us to uh, all sorts of things like immunity certificates, which were touched on there, which could be a part of the way out of all of this, but also part of the way to a new politics. Just one other thing in terms of the new politics, particularly on money, the health secretary there said that he would write off 13 and a half billion of NHS trusts debt in there. That is, the, that, that is an enormous amount of money. It's the sort of thing a chancellor agonises over uh, ages in advance of a, a, a budget and then probably doesn't do. In a stroke of a pen that has been done here, it is a sign of just how extraordinary these times are and just how willing the government is to pile on debt tomorrow to deal with the crisis today. Thanks, Gary. Well, Channel 4 News has been speaking to NHS workers who are caring for people with COVID-19. Our health and social care correspondent, Victoria MacDonald, is here. Victoria. Yes, the amazing NHS staff in England's intensive care units gave us a snapshot of what NHS workers on the front line are facing across the country. At the Royal Free in London, NHS staff are being pushed beyond their normal limits. One frontline worker told us intensive care currently has 59 patients with 56 confirmed COVID cases and a further three patients likely positive. They said COVID patients, positive patients needing intensive care are being looked after in the surgical high dependency unit, theatre recovery, spare recovery, and actually in the operating theatres. The ICU team has been intubating three to five patients every 12 hours for the past few days. They just keep coming, we were told. Now, over at the Royal Berkshire in Reading, one intensive care consultant praised their colleague's team spirit. The doctor explained that their rate limiting step is train staff and that while equipment is tight, they are coping so far and have escalation plans to take to at least 80 ventilated beds. For hospitals in the east of England, the tsunami of coronavirus patients we're hearing about in London has yet to arrive. One doctor at Addenbrooke's in Cambridge said their hospital still has ITU capacity, but the number of patients are increasing rapidly. The hospital has emptied a large number of wards and are filling these up progressively with COVID positive patients and that they will start to flip specialty wards to COVID positive moving forwards. The Midlands has the second largest number of confirmed coronavirus cases in England after London and NHS staff are feeling the strain. One frontline worker at the Royal Derby Hospital said that they could potentially scale up to 90 patients on ventilators if staff aren't sick and are skilled up rapidly. But they said that shortages of personal protective equipment meant staff were often working on a four to six hour end of supply horizon with increasing numbers of patients. And finally, in Yorkshire, we are hearing that it feels like the calm before the storm. One doctor at York Hospital told us it's not really hit yet. We've got seven ICU patients, which is well within our normal capacity. We're expecting it to go up within the next week. The only concern is that the hospital could run out of oxygen. They added that they're unable right now to get any more ventilators or CPAP machines. And if you are an NHS worker and would like to share your experiences on or off the record, you can get in touch with us by email, frontlinestories at itn.co.uk, 
or on social media, that obviously would be on the record, using the hashtag Frontline Stories. Now, earlier I spoke to the World Health Organization's special envoy for the response to COVID-19, Dr David Navarro, and I started by asking him across the globe, how's the world doing? China has shown how to contain outbreaks of this virus, though they've got some new ones starting, so they're having to be very active. South Korea, the same. Singapore, the same. Hong Kong, the same. And indeed, we're seeing similar good work in parts of Europe, in Germany, we believe, uh, and, and so on. But there are other countries in Europe and North America where the response has been a little bit slower at the beginning, and that's meant that there are very large outbreaks underway. And, and where is Britain in that? Is it one of the countries you're talking about in Europe where the response was slow? Well, slow is a, a tricky word to use. I did say slower. The thing that happened in Britain was that getting organised to be able to contain these outbreaks as soon as they started was, was slightly hampered because there were uncertainties as to what the best strategy to use. At the beginning, there was uncertainty about exactly how to treat it. Now, of course, the whole of Britain is on high alert, but at the same time, we've got some quite large outbreaks developing. Uh, and test, test, test was the message from the World Health Organization. Is that still the message? The virus doesn't really live outside people. It's inside, it's in the chest, and it's coughed out in little droplets and then spreads from one person to the other. So the way you find the virus is to take swabs out of people's noses and you see whether or not they're carrying the virus. And testing is key if you're going to do that. If you can't test, then you don't know what's going on. If you can't test your health workers, it's hard also to reassure them that they're able to work. So testing is important. And the countries that seem to have found it possible to get on top of the disease quickly have used testing as a major part of their strategy. There is some scepticism around the world about the Chinese reporting of its figures. Do you believe everything the Chinese told you? Do you think they were completely open and frank? Well, all I can say is that when the World Health Organization team visited China between the 16th and 24th of February, they were allowed to go where they want, talk to who they want, and they got enormous amounts of data. OK, so some countries can't explain exactly what the figures are, and there are questions about it for every country, not just China. But I want to stress that, in our opinion, what we got from China was a pretty good account of what they'd done. Well, I mean, if some countries around the world were slower, as you put it, to react, I mean, do you think perhaps that the World Health Organization has some responsibility for that? I want to stress to everybody that when you're dealing with a problem that is expanding exponentially, when you look back, you would always say we should have done more quicker. I had that in Ebola when I worked on Ebola. And so I'm absolutely totally accepting that there will be questions asked. And I say to everybody, yes, people like myself, we stand ready to be called to account. We expect to be called to account, that's right. But please don't waste time right now focusing on the past because actually we have the most extraordinary epic struggle on in the world today. If we were in a war, you wouldn't be spending your time criticizing generals for making tough decisions. You'd be saying, let's get on and win the war. What is the way out of it, though? How are we going to solve the problem and win the war, as you frame it? Winning the war will take us to a new steady state where we will still have this particular virus lurking in many populations. And what we have to do is to have defences in every community. Does it mean that vulnerable people will be locked down until there's a vaccine? Uh, no, I don't think so. Well, number one, don't assume that there will be a vaccine in any particular time scale. Most people are saying there won't be a vaccine available, efficacious and safe for everybody for at least 18 months. But what it does mean is that vulnerable people will need to be careful and we must invest in public health. It's no, no good trying to do this kind of thing without strong public health capacity in the community, just as we've also got to make sure that our hospitals are equipped to deal with this kind of problem. David Navarro, thank you very much indeed. There were more signs today of the very large number of workers who will be temporarily laid off with their pay subsidised by the government. British Airways and Nissan have both announced today that they are furloughing tens of thousands of workers on 80% salaries. Operations of both companies have come to a standstill under the lockdown. Our political editor Gary Gibbon has this report. British Airways has told its staff it's going to furlough around 30,000 workers on 80% pay up to the end of May. 
Nissan has also announced that it will be furloughing most of its 6,000 workforce in the northeast on 80% of pay at least to the end of this month. The news comes as a survey of businesses suggested many more than the Treasury originally estimated are going to do the same. A lot of businesses are going to be taking advantage of the furlough scheme over the coming days and weeks. Uh, almost one in five businesses saying that they would furlough all of their employees and indeed another significant number saying to us that they would furlough most of their employees. Lunchtime today, the centre of Manchester. The government has announced that the shutdown of shops and businesses propelled just under one million people to apply for universal credit in the last two weeks. Not all of them will have been seeking unemployment benefit, but many were. In the financial crisis, unemployment actually rose far less than we expected, despite being a very deep recession. If we go back to the 1980s, we did see uh, large unemployment, three million people out of work, but it was very geographically focused. This could be much more generalised across the economy. And actually, these rises are happening much quicker than the ones we saw back in the 1980s. Actually, we've probably got to go back to the 1930s to see mass unemployment of a big scale. Now, hopefully, this isn't going to last as long as that, but we, within living memory, we have not seen uh, out-of-work benefits being claimed or anything like the rate we're seeing today. For mid-sized companies suffering because of the shutdown, a new scheme is now expected imminently. The Chancellor will also tweak the existing business interruption loan scheme, dropping the need for companies to have sought a commercial loan first. The government was today asked to punish Premiership football clubs that try to lay off their workforce on reduced pay while keeping their footballers on, on full pay. I've said very similarly to the Premier League that if it doesn't sort this out in quick fashion, then I will urge the Chancellor to introduce a windfall tax after we have got through this current crisis, so to recover the monies that they have taken in order to pay their non-playing members of staff. I think that everybody needs to play their part in this national effort, and that means Premier League footballers too. Given the sacrifices that many people are making, including some of my colleagues in the NHS, who've made the ultimate sacrifice of going into work and have caught the disease uh, and have sadly died, I think the last thing the, the first thing that Premier League footballers can do is make a contribution, take a pay cut and play their part. Maybe a glimpse of a different politics that could emerge from the lockdown and the escalating NHS crisis that spawned it.